All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to our DCAG T live session. We are currently streaming simultaneously on Facebook as well as on YouTube. This session is being recorded and it's gonna be available to view both on the DCAG T as well the, as the DCSD website. So I am Becca Coster and I'm gonna be your moderator this evening. Before we get started, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about DCAG T. So DCAG T stands for the Douglas County Association for Gifted and Talented, and it is a 501c3 nonprofit organization made up of all volunteers. And we have family members, educators, and community members, and we are an affiliate of the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. So we do provide information, share resources, as well as our experiences with others um, about what has worked well for our gifted students. So we are here to help those of you who have just started on your gifted journey with your students, as well as those of you who have been here for a while. So um, we do often talk to families about how to advocate for their gifted students. Um, and we talk a lot about um, how to build strong, long lasting relationships with teachers and educators in order to really partner um, in, to, to find the best um, opportunities for our students. So um, I do wanna honor your time this evening and um, we'll be welcoming our speakers in just a second, um, I am going to have each of them um, introduce themselves to you briefly in just a second. Um, they are going to be presenting for approximately the first half of our session. And then during the second half, we will um, open it up for questions and answers. Um, as is our standard process, you can either type your questions in the chat or you can email your question um, to info at dcagt.org if you prefer some anonymity and I will read those out. So um, I am going to go ahead and um, add everyone to the stream. So first up, you will see um, Jennifer Gottschalk here. Mm -hmm. And um, next is Christy Rathbun, and then David Larson, and last but not least, Ryan McClintock. So thank you to each of you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, so why don't um, each of you just go ahead and introduce yourselves briefly and then we'll um, go ahead and get started. So we'll start with you, Jennifer. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Godstock and I am a gifted education team lead at the district level here in Douglas County. And what that means is that I get to work with all of our wonderful middle school and high school GT facilitators. This is something like year 21 in gifted education for me. And that's not me like fudging about my age. I just actually can't remember. <laughs> but I think it's about it's it's about 21 years. And I'm just excited for you to meet these three wonderful people who are going to talk next. All right, great. So um, David, why don't you go next? Hello, my name is David Larson. I am a teacher at Mountain Vista High School. I'm also the gifted and talented facilitator at that school. Uh, in partnership with one other person. Um, so we're both, both are considered half-time gifted and talented facilitators. And then I am also a district lead for secondary education in the area of gifted programming, identification, ALPs, and that type of thing. So thanks for being here tonight. <laughs> All right, oh, um, we will go to Christy next. <laughs> um, we always love the puppy. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm surprised my dog didn't um, start to chime in. <laughs> um, my name's Christy Rathbun. I'm a teacher at Rock Canyon High School, and um, this is my first year as a gifted education facilitator. Um, but I, I did get to grow up doing some fun GT stuff and, um, and have a little bit of parent experience, too. So I'm just learning so much, and I, I really value... Um, you know, Jennifer and David and Ryan and all of the people that make up Douglas County's gifted education team throughout all the schools. So I'm learning a ton and um, I'm excited to share a little bit about what we do too. Wonderful. Thank you. And last but not least, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it's a great team to work with um, and work on. I'm a, I'm a Castleview High School. My name is Ryan McClintock. I am a 
um, uh, GT facilitator. I'm also a professional learning specialist. That's a role that uh, David also has worked in. And um, I'm an adjunct professor at uh, DU um, where I get to teach um, gifted education to teacher candidates in graduate school, which is a lot of fun uh, to do that. So uh, thank you for having me. Thank you all so much for being here. All right. So with that, um, I believe Jennifer is going to go ahead and start us off. Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Definitely. Made some um, slides for us to kind of talk from. So just as a reminder, this is our topic for tonight, high school and beyond. Um, and then, hold on, let me go into presenter mode here. And then we did um, introduce ourselves, but there's everybody um, and where we work. So this is the kind of the three buckets of topics that we're gonna talk about tonight. Oh, do you like my new graphic, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Disney memes, so good. So we're gonna start with what we promised you to start with, which is high school. And uh, we're gonna hear about both academic programming and also equally important, the affective support that's provided at our, at our Douglas County High Schools. And then we're gonna get a little bit into the post high school planning and decisions, and then some college transition considerations. And then I have some resources to talk about at the end. So um, let's start with academic progr programming, um, which is why, you know, what a lot of people think of first when they think of gifted, but I. I, I definitely put affective, uh, excuse me, on there as a, a very purposefully because I know that that's really important to our our community, our parent and guardian communities to hear about the how we really take care of the whole child. But mm -hmm. um, I, you all call out your batting order, and I forgot already. But let's whoever wants to start, let's talk. Let's hear about <laughs> academic programming in your buildings. I think I was going to start us out. So uh, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, if you're here, you're kind of asking that question of well. I know what my student does in elementary education. I, I know my gift and talent facilitator and, and the different things that he or she works with my son or daughter. But as you transition into middle school, that changes a little bit. There's many more options available. In middle school, there's some transition information that gets shared. Uh, placement in classes in academic programming uh, starts to, to also have skill expectation behind it that you have the requisite skills in either math or language arts or an advanced science or social studies class if, it, if the school offers that, such that uh, you, you're properly placed and have the appropriate level of challenge. And I think that goes up yet again another level or two as you enter into high school. Uh, there's not as much of the transition information in terms of testing currently uh, between as there is between elementary and middle school, but in high school there's an awful lot that we look at in terms of the student interest. So we really, you know, if this is, you know, if this is middle school, high school is this multiplied out in terms of the number of choices of academic programming. We really want philosophically, one thing I'd really like to share is that we really want the child to explore and, and uh, find different areas of passion. Uh, some of the areas of passion that have existed since elementary school will uh, persevere and go on through high school as well, but there'll be many new options to uh, select from as well. And then many different levels of challenge in terms of academic rigor are available. A lot of the decision making becomes very individual because your schedule is made based on your requests from the previous winter, really. Uh, the schools build schedules based on the classes that students request. And so that is a, that uh, counseling and supporting students in that, those decision making processes are very important. I think another thing besides exploration philosophically that I often find myself bringing up is balance. So that there's a balance in the, the challenges that are taken on so that you don't become just, and I appreciate Jennifer that you said academic programming is just the first slide. All these, there's other things that we'll hit on tonight and Christy and Ryan will talk about as well that must play into that decision-making so that academic programming is successful. Um, if, if academic programming is your only focus and only uh, sort of hierarchy in which you look at things, uh, I think personally that I, th I feel that students uh, will miss out on some of the availability of, of learning uh, that is in high school. Um, the other piece of this, we'll get into post-secondary and some other questions that Becca and Jennifer posed to us, but 
I think it's really important the exploration that we also look at some of the skills that students acquire that aren't specific to a uh, traditional <laughs> academic area. And so those are actually a passion of mine as well. So I, I have uh, two courses that I teach, acad excuse me, agriculture business and home and apartment repair. So some practical skills that uh, I think also are important. And then we have, you know, obviously performing arts and, and fine arts and other areas of exploration that are, I think, necessary for a well-rounded student. So I think I'll pass it on to Ryan, if you want to add on to that. Yeah, sure. I um Thanks, David. I, I think that the academic programming is often uh, the first opportunity to really to, to get to know the students that are coming into um, high school and start kind of talking about their schedule, like you, you mentioned, and, what, and what's available and what's offered um, for, you know, to go into high school kind of eyes wide open. Um, I think last time uh, we counted, there was something like over 240 uh, potential offerings um, in the school. And uh, for them to to be able to kind of, like David said, explore and know all the options that are out there from, from of course, your kind of your accelerated content, like your your, your AP and, and, your, and your IB and your, your concurrent enrollment, but also um, some of the pretty unique um, uh, elective type courses, the kind of interdisciplinary type courses um, uh, that, that uh, David also mentioned that were offered at his school and also at Castleview as well. Um, but that, uh, th this is a great time to really get to know the students and welcome them. In, into the high school as they're transitioning uh, vertically from the middle school is to start talking about the academic programming um, and then also maybe even introducing them to some teachers that they, they very well may have um, as, as they come across from middle school to high school and just really start the conversation and oftentimes renorming the, the, the advanced learning plan, the ALP, um, and what does it mean at, at a high school compared to say a middle school or an elementary school um, and uh, what, what conversations might that start and uh, how do teachers use those documents? And, um, and then another piece of the academic pro programming on the other side is also working with our, our colleagues and our teachers as, as well so that um, they're as informed as they can be with the students they're working with, but also um, uh, with respect to uh, instruction and pedagogy um, and uh, best practices working with gifted learners. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Christy, you want to you want to add there to academic programming? Right. I, I think the, the biggest thing that I would add is in speaking to students who were on ALPs and graduated and they've gone through college, they're off into the workplace. They said pretty resoundingly how important it was to mm -hmm. challenge themselves in areas that they weren't identified in. Mm -hmm. And so to take that theater class, to, to take the student media class, to take ceramics or something that was maybe out of their wheelhouse and, and to challenge themselves outside of their identified area. And so um, I think emphasizing what David and, and Ryan both have said about, you know, yeah, get those, those core classes that challenge the areas where they were identified, but also stretch your wings and learn how to learn how to push yourself out of your comfort zone, because definitely when they get mm -hmm. out of college, they don't necessarily have, you know, their ALP at college, they don't have, you know, some of those same supports. So it, it's important for us to coach them through, you know, fun things, PE, team sports, right? and, you know, things that they never would have thought that they would do, but that really helped them find new passions and loves. That's great. A great thought, Christy. The other thing that that brings to my mind is many of our kids, by the time they've gotten to high school, have found areas that they enjoy much more than the areas they're identified in. Mm -hmm. So we'll have kids who will come in at identified in you know reading and writing and really are not interested in taking an advanced course in that area. They're interested in a science or math or a, a humanity study of some kind. So that's an excellent uh, point. A lot of that comes stems back to open communication which I think all the things that have been mentioned so far really right. hinge on that. Um, I just wanted to jump in and, and let our parents know, we, <laughs> while we do our best to be acronym and jargon free, we, 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 some, we cannot operate that way. And so <laughs> I do have a resources slide that I'm gonna be sharing with you. And I have a definition and a link for what is AP, which is advanced placement. And then what is IB, which is International Baccalaureate and the Diploma Program. So that's there for you later to click into if you're not familiar with those terms. 
Right. That, that actually makes me think to uh, just how, um, and I think, I can't remember who said it, but um, the importance of balance that sometimes, you know, they can get so caught up in, I'm going to be a physicist and I'm going to take every physics class there is here at this school and the other schools, but, um, you know, trying to maybe step back a little bit and, and take a class that's more exploratory or, um, you know, that isn't an advanced placement to, to find that balance would be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the, the concept of balance is such an important one. And, um, and, and really getting to know our students and, and, and what they're interested and capable of. Um, Cause sometimes that, that balance uh, folks want to say, well, that inherently might be too much. Um, but as you actually know the student, you realize it's, 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 it's not in this case, like this is something that really is within the student's kind of ability to balance that. Um, and sometimes that requires kind of almost like a, uh, a polishing or a hand scheduling sometimes of, 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 of some schedules and some courses and um, some, some review of the, the why and the purpose that might stretch some prerequisites um, every now and again um, in terms of certain courses. So yeah, that, that concept of balance is really, really important. It's not always pumping the brakes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that also reminds me that uh, it's important for adults and, and youth not to compare themselves with somebody else. So there's a lot of pressure in kind of hinting it at what, uh, you know, Ryan was saying that I see in kids that is rarely helpful. And I don't want to dip too much into the social emotional pot side, but it really has significant effect impacts on them, not always very positive. So recognizing each individual student as somebody who's working with them, but then that individual student recognizing that every gift, interest, and um, skill that they have is of equal value to anybody else's combination of gifts, mm -hmm. skills, or abilities. There's a quote that one of my writer friends has on a bracelet because she needs to see it every day, and it's, comparison is the thief of joy. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I can look at the reference, but I really do think, that, you know, um, National Novel Writing Month does a thing in April as well. And they sent out this really funny text the other day, like, and it basically said, eyes on your own paper. Don't compare yourself <laughs> to other writers. If you're writing for you. You're competing against yourself. And I thought, yeah, eyes on your own paper is a, it may, maybe has broader applications than I had initially thought as a classroom teacher. But I think that you all bring up a really good point. Um, are you ready to move on and talk about affective programming? Because we've already kind of started touching on that. So, okay, cool. Let's talk about that. Because I, I do think that's important for our parents to hear how we are collaborating with our counseling team, mm -hmm. how we work with, like, for example, um, two of your schools and then adding a third have clustered advisement and how that takes care of our some of our affective needs. So I'm going to kind of put you back in the same batting order or you can change it up. We're all we're all adults here. You you choose. <laughs> Either way, I'm happy to I'm happy to go ahead and get the ball rolling, and then uh, yeah, lead off, lead off, David. Mm -hmm. I think that this past year has really driven home to me the importance of a student's health, mentally, mental health, and you know social emotional health. Uh, my own included in that. I think this has been one of the toughest years in my 31 years in teaching that I've ever experienced. And I think without a, a strong, healthy relationship within a family, that's always going to be your first priority. If that communication stays open, always uh, valued higher and more importantly than any point I might want to make to my son or daughter or to a student is that they feel valued, loved, and safe um, with me. Um, that is, we need to keep reminding ourselves of that because as nice as, you know, the I was, I think you're probably not far off, Ryan, 240 options, you know, it literally, it's, it's crazy. You'd have to stay eight, 10 years to be able to take all the classes that are available. All that and anything that might be taught in there comes secondary to the person's wholeness when they leave and that they can uh, pass on you know, wholeness to other people that they're around. So that health is, it just cannot be um, overstated. And I think more, it's driven home to me um, more and more this past year. I think some of the structures that, um, that are very, very helpful in this area is the numbers at each of our schools at the secondary level uh, is large. Um, varies widely, but it can be as, as high as over 400. 
And so if you're trying to keep track of the individual needs and, and academic support for over 400 kids or 200 kids, name the number, and it's one of your jobs, as you've heard, each one of us has another job. It, it helps tremendously to have another set of eyes, a bunch of different sets of eyes on these kids so that they see a weekly kind of check in with these kids. So that's what has been mentioned is a, a clustered advisement. I think next year, all three of us. Is that right, Christy? You're joining in. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I think we'll be really close to all secondary schools having uh, small cluster groups of gifted kids at least once a week. Sometimes some schools have had twice a week or more where they like a homeroom. If you remember back to when you were going to school, it might have been something. Um, so anywhere from 20, 25 kids and the teacher knows that they're all identified, gifted and talented. And they, we, at Christy, Ryan and I help to develop their understanding of what that means, how they can best support some of the issues that can come up that are unique to these learners, which I'll let Christy kind of and Ryan chime in on some more of the specifics, but I think I think that smaller. I have 18 of them, just to give you an idea of my numbers. Um, it, I don't would not sleep well at night without those 18 advisement teachers who, in a normal year, not this year, but in a normal year, would see those kids face to face for half an hour a week, mm -hmm. and um, would be able to really support them and know them, know their goals, know their tendencies, know their kind of pitfalls and be able to support them individually better and bring me and bring the counselors and other uh, support system in there. There's, there's a, teams at every school that really are uh, interested in helping these kids, but to get down to a size where those kids have a voice regularly, I think is really critical for uh, this effective support. I am going to jump in if you don't mind, Ryan. Um, one of the things I, we, we've done a couple things. Um, one teamed up with counseling where um, I get to, to sit in on IEP meetings and 504 meetings for a lot of our two E students. And um, sometimes their social emotional needs are, are even greater than, um, than our, our regular students, our regular GT kids. And it's been really helpful today. There was one where we were talking about, you know, just turning in work and so often gifted students have a hard time just turning in the paper, you know, clicking submit yeah. for so many reasons. And it came out of that, how, how helpful it would be in one of these clustered seminars to talk about the difference or to teach the difference between the lesson of being able to turn something in as its own lesson, its own skill, um, recognizing that if it's not perfect, they're, the skill is still turning it in. So that was kind of cool. The The other thing that we talked about was being able to do, you know, maybe draft email templates or scripts that they could practice with each other, maybe in their seminar class or that we could provide for them. Um, so I think, you know, these, these little meetings, these opportunities to partner with counseling and to partner with these students, um, we forget that they're still kids, you know, they can learn so fast and they impress us in so many ways, but they also have anxiety and these fears of, oh my gosh, I have to talk to an adult and I didn't turn in the assignment because it just wasn't good enough. And now I'm late and it won't, um, you know, all those things ramp up. So the affective element of some tangible items that we can provide them, I think has been really helpful and I'm excited about putting them into those those clustered seminars. We'll be in our second year, so it'll be our freshmen and sophomores next year that have the the seminar classes. Nice. And th the other thing that's cool is that we're getting more of our faculty trained on what yeah. a gifted learner is, which is so mm -hmm. huge. I, I love that Douglas County has put us in these schools that they're committed to to funding to educate you know more people in the community about about these great learners. Right. I mean, you both said so much there. And, and especially with that, that last point, uh, Christy, in terms of working and kind of building that capacity um, in our staff for those kind of those support systems, those teams of resources involving counselors, um, uh, 504 specialists, special education. Um, and, and a lot of that oftentimes is, is 
can can start nicely with you know what is an advanced learning plan? Where does this come from? Um, why does Colorado have an advanced learning plan? Uh, really, what does this mean? What does it mean to be strength based um, in, in terms of, of an approach like the ALP is? And um, and then really recognizing oftentimes that many of our colleagues from teachers to counselors have not had any kind of formal uh, training in gifted education. And this might be their, their first opportunity, um, even if it is kind of at a, at a, at a, at a school-based um, initial training over lunch, but that is gonna scale up, right? Um, I, I, I know that we're gonna be continuing and uh, have been and will offer even more at the district level um, for our, our staff to really start to understand um, what what does it mean uh, to be identified as, as a gifted learner? Um, what they, they may hear terms like overexcitabilities, and they might hear terms um, like asynchronous development. What does this mean? And then um, working with our students, how is it okay for them to kind of really start to peel off these masks um, that maybe they've learned to kind of wear to kind of hide um, some of their insecurities and, and open up where some, in some cases, some, some anxiety might reside um, a little bit. And and knowing that that's okay, that's part of their balance system, and how can we work together um, to 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 move forward um, um, in knowledge from that? So I just kind of echo the whole idea of um, building that capacity uh, with our staff to work with the students, and then building those supports that the, those clustered structured advisement programs have been absolutely wonderful um, to observe the students interacting, but also the teachers as well uh, working with uh, the students. So. Yeah. So I'll just add one last piece, which is that we've done, gosh, I think this is going into our third year of some very purposeful cross teaming at the district level with our mm -hmm. counseling staff. So um, we got to do partnering training new counselors that are coming to the district. They got time with me. I was like, okay, <laughs> counseling gifted kids is sometimes different than counseling typically developing kids. Um, Earlier, Christy said 2E, for those of you who don't know, that's one of the ways we say twice exceptional, which means you are, and Christy called this part out, you are gifted and you also have a 504, you're formally identified as gifted and you also have an individual education plan for special education. So, um, but our counselors needed to know that it's com it's complicated, right? Like it's the ultimate, it's complicated because already adolescence is complicated. And then you've got like just a bigger engine under the hood sometimes and lots of different things that uh, you know, more complex engine maybe. And how do we, like David started off this section, value and love and appreciate all the unique facets that um, our gifted students bring to us every day. I feel like the older I get, the more curious I get and the more of an appreciator I am. Cause I'm like, wow, what you did was so interesting just then, <laughs> um, which is nice. That's, that's a stance you can have not, it's easier when you're not the parent. I can tell you as a parent, it's a little bit harder to sit back and go, uh, you know, uh-huh, I appreciate you. No, stop. <laughs> we, we did a session about this another time around our very spicy children that have lots of things they want to argue about. But yeah. at any rate, um, I just wanted to, for those who are wondering, uh, or specifically around when we get into a space of mental health needs, um, we are doing some continuous cross-teaming and work where um, some of the district counseling staff has come and presented at our meetings. We are presenting at their meetings and we are, have an open channel of communication so that we don't accidentally leave a stone unturned when we're trying to provide students what they need and trying, as we started off this section, talking about that entire human who is in front of us and we need to make sure we have every resource in place for them. Mm -hmm. So I just think an, another, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. No, no, go. No, you go. I'm done. I think another consideration in this area is intensity that mm -hmm. the kids come to us with. And it can come, as Jennifer mentioned, sort of out of the blue, like, whoa, I'm not sure I saw that coming <laughs> on a particular topic or an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, senses of justice and are really tend to be fairly well developed in these kids. And they have mm -hmm. pretty good rationale and can defend a position pretty well. Um, not always um, respecting another person's position. So part I think of also of effective support is helping them understand that others may have different opinions that are maybe just as well reasoned out to them and, and listening. So I think a, a, a truly happy, well-adjusted adult is someone who knows kind of appropriately when to step in and when, when to uh, step in and confront or when to listen and, and grow and learn. And so that openness uh, when an intensity, when we strike a chord of intensity with a kid, um, 
sometimes when we're talking then we have to be careful to kind of, okay, let's maybe take a different route around this, but help them also to see, well, when this situation comes up, I know I can be a little bit overwhelming to people. Um, if they are able to express that, I think ultimately uh, the human need for all of us is, is to belong and to uh, feel understood and be seen. And some of these kids, that intensity can sometimes get in the way of being understood and, and feeling like they're seen because there's not many that can match that level of both intellectual reasoning, but also the spiritedness with which they bring that intellectual intellectual reasoning to bear. <laughs> bit, you know, wow. And so I'm also talking to parents with this same thing. You may not understand some of the things that kind of spin your kid up, if I, if I may use that term. Um, and that's okay. See, you know, ask questions, find out um, what what kind of if they know what makes them get to a point where their either perfectionism gets in the way, or an intensity gets in the way, or an injustice in a class or a class requirement gets in the way. Those can kind of hobble their mm -hmm. um, outlook and ability to succeed academically when they have a they, this this turmoil within them. Mm -hmm. Even with you know current events and things that are going on in the world, they're carrying the weight on their shoulders. You know that empathy is so strong that mm -hmm. they'll either shut down sometimes or they won't try something new. And so I yeah I completely agree with that. I chose this picture in case people are wondering because I was thinking Ryan of the remind system you use to to text students and I think Christy and David you have similar things you do but. We do have lots of ways that students can stay in contact with our GT facilitators in the building for any and all of the things we've been talking about. Um, but I, and I also like, I like the student's face, but I, <laughs> but I just wanted to say like, just as a, because I do think in prior times, depending on the age of the students, you know, if this is your first year going through high school in Douglas County or your fourth, things have shifted and, and I should pause and celebrate that we have staffing in our high schools for the first time this year, every high school has staffing. Um, and that has not been the case previously. High schools have had staffing, but it didn't always come directly from from district. And that was directly part of our, our bond. Our voters are very clear. Um, and I we always so appreciate that. So I do want to celebrate that. But I, um, I know I've had parents ask me, well, how do we even know who the GT person is in our building? And no one has asked this year, <laughs> which I think is also a celebration and part of all the contact that you all have you know, the messages you send, whether it's by text or by email or just the availability that you have um, to students. So before we move on, I yeah. just wanted to, to celebrate that. And, and I, I, I want to add two thoughts to that, if I may. One is mm -hmm. with respect to the, to the staffing at the high schools, I think with like, with like more increasing precision too, in terms of like what, what, what roles work well um, with the GT facilitator and what roles maybe don't. And so um, uh, with just kind of an unapologetic like, this, this is what it needs to be so that you're there and present for these students. And mm -hmm. the other thing is in terms of, I, I have not found the one system that works well for all my students, but rather whether it's tech service, remind, email, or through our learning management system or something, there's different ways they can get there. And I don't really care which one they use as long as they use one of them um, mm -hmm. uh, when they kind of need to raise the flag or something like that to get a little help. Mm -hmm. So um, th thank you, Ryan. I was saying mm -hmm. to, um, to Becca and to Heather Groff um, on our team that the timing of this session is actually quite perfect because um, decision day is May 1st. Um, and a lot of students are thinking, who, you know, I have, I got into three of the five colleges I applied to, or maybe I want to take a gap year, but there's, there's a lot of pressure sitting right this minute on our high school seniors. So I thought this comic was very appropriate. Um, I had it up there if you didn't read it. <laughs> The punchline is at the end, there's no heavier burden than a great potential. And a lot of these students have had a lot of adults tell them about their potential. And now it's time to like pay that bill. You know, that's kind of how they, you know, it's now it's time to prove that I do in fact do have the potential that people have been telling me about all this time. And it, and it just feels like a lot of weight that they're carrying. So as we move into this next section, just know, and you've already heard um, sort of the empathy and the kindness from the, the folks on the panel. And I just, just want you to know that's how we that's how we lean into these conversations with our students. So, so for college transitions, there's that's some of our students go straight out of high school, right into a four year college or university. 
some of our students take a gap year and, and our folks are gonna talk about that in a minute. Some of our students have heard, and, and, and I, it was just actually on the news this morning, that it might be more financially sound to do your first couple of years at a community college and then transfer into a university sophomore or junior year. Um, some of our students choose a path into the military, some choose to go right to work. So I think sometimes when parents uh, or guardians hear that, they're, that their child is up as gifted, they immediately get like, you know, Harvard in their eyes or like Princeton or they, and what we were talking about before the live session started is unfortunately or fortunately, depending how you see it, there is no one path, there is no one right answer. So um, before we talk a little bit more about some resources, I just thought, Christy, I know you've talked to some former students, maybe you can talk a little bit about their transitions. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I spoke with three former students who were all um, identified as gifted learners. They had ALPs. And then I'm in touch with, you know, former editors from from student media and that kind of thing. And, you know, the biggest thing I mentioned it before that they came back to was working with their support group, whether that was their parents or a teacher, a counselor, their gifted ed facilitator. Um, to choose the courses that that we're going to help them feel challenged mm -hmm. and we're going to help them get those skills about, you know, organization deadlines, all that type of thing. But then also balancing those out with things that they that we're going to challenge them, that we're going to get them outside of their comfort zone. So all of them thought um, felt that when they pushed into electives, when they really, made decisions to take, you know, a drama class, even if it was only one and they never came back. Um, even if they decided to do choir um, and never did it again, it really helped them to kind of find where their passions were. I, one of my students, um, she thought she was going to be a scientist and took an elective um, in biotech. And we have an incredible biotech program. Like, I can't imagine that anybody wouldn't find their whole livelihood there, right? And she said she took a class and realized that it really wasn't what she wanted to do. And she was glad that she had the opportunity to kind of explore a little bit in that, to be able to know, okay, when I get to college, I'm going for, you know, the major of pre-med and then all of a sudden I'm going to be a marketing ma major and now she's doing marketing for Sonic. Um <laughs> you know, and is doing the spicy crispy sandwich. So, um, you know, I think to, to kind of come back to the, the question of the topic, um, it really, in talking to all of them, it was about, yep, here's the pathway in my area and my core, but I've got to challenge myself so that I can handle when curveballs are thrown my way at college, when all of a sudden I get there and I realize, wait, this isn't really what I want to do. Or maybe, you know, instead of, oh no, they got it wrong. I'm a fraud. I'm an imposter. It's, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just going to change paths and I know how to do that. So. Thank you. Um, David, you were going to talk a little bit about gap year because you know, you, ha you have some experience with that. Sure. So gap year, the concept with that is, is that instead of feeling the compulsion or necessity to go directly to college, declare a major and pursue that. Uh, many students, even with the exploration that we're talking about, are, are not sure what that should be, uh, what they should study, what they should spend their, their hard earned money um, learning. Um, so a gap year is, a, is just as it sounds, it doesn't have to be immediately after high school, many times it is. Students will often work um, I've had many of my gifted students go into service industry, work at restaurants and automotive repair shops and those types of things for a year. And then some of them decide that that's what they want to do for even a little bit longer. They might take a couple of years. But the idea being is, is that you explore during that year as well. So in the exploration side, uh, internships historically have been a, a, a great opportunity for the kids. It, that has been one another thing that's really tough in our current situation is those internships and getting access in there. But we've had kids go through the legislative uh, branches of the state government. Uh, we've had them go through uh, technical offices, medical, scientific, engineering, uh, those types of things. And just as Christy said, 
some of them go, oh, that's what that is. I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> and that's sure nice <laughs> to find out in either an unpaid or a paid internship versus, you know, $40,000 worth of tuition in your first year of engineering school somewhere. Right. Um, so I think there's some real value to that. Uh, my own children have not gone traditionally through college. I'm about to graduate my youngest one. My oldest one graduated a couple of years ago. Uh, neither one of those two went straight through. All of them did some form of work or mission or travel um, work, service work. So, and then I have one who is is still trying to figure out what his next steps will be, and he's taken some college. So each one of those is as back to what Brian, Jennifer, Christy have said, is an individual that has a unique set of needs, interests, challenges, skills, all those things that kind of wrapped up. Not to overwhelm you, but just listen. Listen carefully to your children. Um, they, if you, if they know you are supportive and loving and accepting, and you have, they have a safe place with you, they're going to have to, on some level, figure some of this out on their own. And uh, each each child is unique in how much support direct they might need. You know that from you know working with your children, as well as anybody else. That you know one thing that works with the oldest doesn't work with the youngest or the middle or whatever. Um, so I think that's key in this as well. Um, the other thing that I think really stands out related to this uh, college transition is the finances of it. I think mm -hmm. some kids and families, it's a very stressful transition. Um, there are options available that you may discover in a gap year or in working while going part-time to school or even, I love the idea of a JC, junior college, sorry, that's that dates me, community college. <laughs> um, experience because then you may find out you may be inspired by you know professor rathbun or professor mcclintock about some particular topic and now all of a sudden you find a passion area mm -hmm. and um or and or through your work so uh i guess the message is don't rush and don't pressure yourself to feel like once again that you need to go immediately into four years of college um well, and some internships might even pay for that college. Yes, like if you're yeah. in some place, they might say, oh, well, we're going to pay for you to advance your education in this field. And Yes. Ryan, did you want to say anything there? I, I was going to tell a parent story, but you you might have some thoughts before we move on. Um, yeah, I, I can just add, there's such, really, such wonderful information, um, everyone there. I, I, I wrote down a couple notes here just to mention the idea of um, – one of the things I, I, I think we find ourselves doing a lot as we get to know our students is kind of introducing them to, to other folks either in, in the building and sometimes outside of the building to kind of serve as just significant kind of adults in their life or mentors even, um, uh, folks that the students can ask their questions, um, that they're just really encouraged to continue to just ask all the questions that are on their mind and kind of seek some answers. Um, there are, you know, there are some courses out there too that are entirely designed around that. Um, that allows students kind of through their own volition um, or if you use the term agency or something like that to be able to kind of um, chase their curiosity a little bit to kind of, mm -hmm. if, if, if they're experiencing quite a bit of like, you know, that multi-potentiality or something, like really start to understand what is driving them and, and, and for them to know as they explore, I think that's a big theme that keeps coming up here as they explore, to understand that as their skill sets evolve um, through life, that that's a, that's, that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, uh, and, and then how, how might that impact kind of their trajectory, their journey? Mm -hmm. And um, I just also want to really echo the idea of listening. Uh, I believe uh, that, that my colleague said, um, listening to, to, to understand um, in, in a judgment-free, um, mm -hmm. um, safe environment. And I'll pause there, Jennifer, because I, I, I really want to hear your story. Oh, well, so it's a... It's not exactly a counterpoint. I have a I have an older child who is a junior in college, and that was always it has been pretty hyper focused. Um, with one big change, so Simone wanted to be a paleo artist right up until she realized that her love for Japan and this is a lot, y'all, was greater than her love for dinosaurs. I mean, and if you have that dinosaur kid at home, you know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, so Simone is a Japanese major. And one of the things that was really, in, you know, I think 
kind of to everyone's point was that I was never so invested. I thought it was so cool to be a paleo artist, but I'm not going to get now be like, no, you can't be a Japanese. Like that's not, no, no, it's her life. And she's great at Japanese. By the way, I learned, and it's true that Spanish and Japanese have similar phonemes. So Simone had the seal of biliteracy in Spanish and English. And actually I think Japanese was a, has been a really, um, from, from a phonemic anyway perspective, been a really cool transition for her. But anyway, so just as a parent, I needed to not get out of the way, but just make sure I'm, I'm managing my own self-talk as my title is making this significant change. Um, the other thing that is interesting as a parent is that this in this particular year is that my um, Simone took freshman year, or sorry, first semester of junior year off because online learning really wasn't working, just wanted to be home. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. Like you graduate a year later, semester later, not a huge deal. No, Simone was like, no, I will be on time to graduate period the end. And that was her drive. So again, I had to like step aside and know that, okay. And just be, and listen and support and be like, okay, what, okay. So that's what your goal, what does your advisor say? What do you need? And I, and I think that's that dance we do as parents, as our, as our, our guardians of our children become more independent is listening, like everyone has said, and then asking what do you need, or maybe you co-investigate resources, but mm -hmm. you let them figure out their own outcome. So Ryan, I just wanted to add that little bit because I, um, and I was saying to the group earlier, like when Simone was six, she's been identified since kindergarten and, and life is, I always say, <laughs> if there was a decision moment, Simone always picked the hardest path. She was like, that's a smooth path. That's That looks really difficult. That's the one I want. And, mm -hmm. and um, if someone had, could have told me when she was six, don't worry, don't worry, she's going to go to college, I would have been so relieved to have, have uh, so I'm just going to tell you, even if you're the parent of a difficult six-year-old right now, these outcomes are still possible for you too. And they won't right. necessarily be sucking their thumbs, you know, or, you know, wearing their clothes inside out. We had some challenges like that at our house um, for college, you, unless it's on purpose, right? So, um <laughs> Well, yeah. I'm going to jump in really quickly yeah. too, and, and just say that we had a guest speaker come in the other day to our newspaper class, and he's the publisher market president for the Denver Business Journal. And he said, you know, I went to college for three weeks, and then I couldn't do it. And, you, you know, I know that for some parents, that's like, oh my gosh, don't tell my kid not to go to college. <laughs> but his point really was, you know, coming back to exploring. He, he said, you know, I always want to find something new to do. And I got an internship and I worked really hard and then I made connections. And, you know, I think Ryan, you had um, mentioned how important mentors can be. And so, you know, just like our clustered seminars, give them a chance to talk to each other and they value each other's opinions and they respect each other's experiences, sometimes more than they do their parents. Um, sometimes finding the right you know, examples, the, the, the students who have been in their shoes and, and made it through in a multitude of paths um, can lend a little credibility to what the parents are saying at home um, and show some of those different pathways to let, to let us all know, yeah, it's going to be okay. So Becca, we're, I know we're over our presentation time and we are ready to go to questions. And then I'm, and I'm giving you Becca the bit.ly to the resources slide so you can share that Okay. With folks. Wonderful. So mm -hmm. please um, either type your questions in the comments and um, I will read those. Or if you prefer, um, you can email your question to info at dkagt.org if you prefer a little more anonymity. So I am going to go ahead and... Um, Put this in the comments. All right, here we go. All oh, right. and actually, I'm going to refresh this just quick. I apologize. I updated this slide to add the links for AP and IB. Apologize for that oh, flickering you. on your yeah. screen. That's actually a really common question that we haven't specifically touched on. I know Ryan mentioned IB and, and AP. Um, both are great options. Uh, we have, do we have three high schools or just two with IB programs? Is it three now? Uh, it's two. Two. So Douglas County High School and Thunder Ridge have IB programs. 
all the high schools though have AP uh, programs in them, so advanced placement programs. There's a the real the research best supports the value of these being taking the content at that level mm. as the primary benefit of these. The mm. the secondary benefit of these is that you are able to take a score, get a take a test that gives you a score that may or may not be helpful to you at, depending on the college you go to and the program you enter. Um, as is the same with you get an IB diploma um, through the International Baccalaureate. So those are the two, two ways of accessing. They both access higher content. In general, you have a humanities, strong humanities, social science uh, focus in the International Baccalaureate. You, you still do the other cores. In advanced placement classes, you tend to select kind of a la carte what it is that you want to take at that highest level. And I'm guessing probably each of our high schools is somewhere in the vicinity of 25 to 20, you know, 30 mm -hmm. of those advanced placement classes available in different areas and probably mostly similar in what's available. But those are kind of the, the AP comes up and the IB. And then the next question is often, which is better? And you can't answer that on a form mm -hmm. like this. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if I taught at either one of those schools, I would say the same thing. It really mm -hmm. depends on the on the child. And both mm -hmm. those schools that have IB programs also have AP. Offerings. Yeah. So, but on the Big Future site, all the high yeah, schools. on this Big Future site, which is the third link on this slide, if you are, as a, as a family, you're thinking about credit transfer, that's actually a filter you can do. So what Big Futures is, David, I think this, this is okay segue, is Big Futures um, lets you compare colleges the way the Verizon website lets you compare cell phones. And then you can check the filters you wanna focus on. Like, do I wanna look at screen size? Okay, I'm gonna compare by screen size. Wanna look at battery life? Okay, I'm gonna compare by battery life. And with colleges, you can compare, does, you know, who has, um, like I know uh, someone that was here earlier, her daughter wanted to do research as an undergrad and not every college lets undergrads really do research, right? So they were filtering by that. Some people wanna filter by, um, what kind of religious communities are available on campus. Some people wanna know, is it, can you be a commuter or do you have to live on campus? Some people, you know, so it really does let you do all of that. You can also filter by regions of the country and also look at um, international schools that um, work with the college board. Now this is just one place to start, but it's really big. And in this COVID time, another lovely link that's on many of the college's sites, once you start on Big Futures, is a virtual tour of the campus. Mm. So, for some of our students, just a vision, like not every school looks like Hogwarts, but not every school looks like UCD, right? So, or, or CU Boulder. So just to help our students get a vision, you know, and I think some of them, even you get to go inside of a dorm room virtually or go inside the dining hall virtually. So I think for our students who have anxious feelings about what can I expect, those virtual tours are really useful. Um, so that's why I wanted you to have that link there. And then, um, the Gifted Challenges blog is one of the few blogs that's really addressing sort of college and high school. So there's some nice things to think about here. And the No Frills articles is just 10 more links for you. Um, Becca, are you seeing questions that we can speak to? I'm not I'm not seeing any comments, but maybe you have some. I don't have any questions. Okay. And I know we've kind of spoken in an anticipatory way. So I'll just quick go over these other resources. And then Becca, did you have any seed questions that you were thinking of? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have anything that you all didn't address. Okay, that's cool. Um, so I'll just, since I already told you about the resources, so sorry, I have to repeat myself for you, but, um, so in career exploration, so, so to put this in context, I was teaching at a middle school and I had an eighth grade class that I was doing a, a semester elective with, and it was really just kind of this cool design your own elective. And one of the things we did was a whole unit on college and career. So, um, what you're, if for those of the teachers listening, what you're hearing is I was writing my own curriculum <laughs> for a semester, but I found these really cool resources for my students to help them think about kind of the things we've been talking about. So what Road Trip Nation does, and there's a free side and a paid side, um, Big Futures is linked up to your student's Naviance account, and David thinks Road Trip Nation might be as well, but we're not sure, but definitely check it out, even just do the free stuff. What it does is it lets you pick career clusters and then look at these little short videos or little um, bios of people who got to their careers through a non-traditional pathway. Um, 
and it may be something like a gap year or something like an internship or something like, um, you know, they, they went on a trip with a friend and they were like, oh my gosh, Santa Fe is the best place I've ever been. And then they, instead of thinking about a job, they started thinking about the place they wanted to be, right? And then how do I make a living in, in, in Santa Fe or wherever that might be? Um, one of my dear friends actually, sorry parents, this is a true story. So graduates Phi Beta Kappa, is clerking with a judge, getting ready to apply to law school and goes out, and this is in Houston, and goes out to visit some friends in San Francisco, calls her parents and says, send my stuff leaves the internship and gets a job at an Indonesian travel agency. True story. Um, landed on her feet, later went to law school and is doing incredible things. But can you be, can you imagine being those parents and being like, what? <laughs> but anyway, Road Trip Nation has stories like that. David, David's like, I've been there. Um, the I occupational, can imagine that. <laughs> oh yeah, right? Send my stuff. Um, the Occupational Outlook Handbook is super cool. This is managed by the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And how it works is, let's say that you want to be, um, I was saying, a landscaped architect. That's a really cool job. You could even do that as an Imagineer, but you're not sure how much money that is. And also if you need to go to college for it. And so you can click into these, again, career clusters and it's very granular. So then you click down into the job and look at a salary. And then from the job, you can then click on a map of the US and see how much does a landscape designer make in Los Angeles versus Houston versus New Orleans versus Asheville, North Carolina. And then it also shows you, can you do this? What's the pathway into these salaries? Do I just, is it on the job training? Is it a two year um, degree, like associate's degree? Is it four years? Is it, uh, you know, and on the flip side, if you want to be a research chemist, we're maybe talking about a PhD, but it, it shows you all of that. So I think for kids, you know, no matter what age, I think that's just helpful to think through salary and training and kind of parts of the country. And, and, and the last, this, oh, this is occup one? the Occupational Outlook Thank Handbook. You. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm into it. And then um, the last one, which is uh, links to the Occupational Outlook Handbook is called Texas Reality Check. And I'm so sorry. I desperately want this for Colorado. So any web designers out there, um, so, so what this does is you first you start and you say, okay, what's what size city do I live in? So this is how I did it with my Colorado students. I said, you know, you know, there's the capital, there's like smaller cities, there's like smaller towns. So you, first you pick a city, then you pick, are you going to live alone, live with your parents, live with roommates? And it walks you through how much, you know, are you paying back student loans? How much are you going to put in savings? Are you going to spend money on clothes? Are they going to be plain clothes or fancy clothes? Are you going to spend money? I even ask, like, how much money are you going to spend on shampoo? Which for some people, that's an important question. Other people, like, some of my students were like, what? And other students were like, oh, yeah, legit. And then talking about, are you going to have basic cable or fancy cable? And what kind of a cell phone? And a pet is extra money. And like it, and then it basically, you, so what you what it does is it adds up all the things you say you want for your lifestyle and then it tells you how much money you have to make to live in that city and then if you're and then the other link is okay if you want to live in Houston and you want to spend i cuz we with my students we played a game to like either be the highest roller like spend the max on everything to see how much that would be and also the lowest like who could live the cheapest and where so if you wanted to live be a high roller in Houston that's like $125,000 a year and then you can link and see what jobs you would have to have. So it takes you back to the occupational outlook handbook to see how much money, which jobs make. So you'd have to basically be like a neurosurgeon in Houston. And then it, it right. So I just, for, for me, I approach it as play, not as a, cause these are eighth graders. So it wasn't uh, like a do or die and it was Texas, but um, from a family perspective, this is just so fun. If, if, again, if you approach it with play and we don't have a Colorado equivalent, but it is, it's just a nice walkthrough because we've all been there as, as parents and guardians. You don't want to be the one who's like delivering the hard news that having a pet costs a lot of money, right? <laughs> so we can let this website do that for us instead. Because my younger one keeps saying she wants to have a husky. And, and we're like, but you want to be a flight attendant or, you know, what? <laughs> like, yeah. It, 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 so instead, let this website do that for you. So that's just the last resource. Oh, gosh, and we're almost at our time. But I... So get back, I guess, do people sometimes mail in questions later? Because I think any of us would be happy to respond at a later date. Yeah, definitely. Um, people sometimes email questions afterwards. So okay. if um, 
if you all have questions and you haven't had a chance, um, you can either comment them um, on Facebook or on YouTube, or you can send an email to info at dkagt.org, and I will make sure um, to send uh, an answer to you. So I'll, I'll connect back with you all. So I do wanna thank each of you so much for sharing with us this evening. I know um, myself as a parent got so much okay. from this. Um, and a lot of what you said validated me as a student who <laughs> even in um, my current age does not know what I wanna be when I grow up. Um, right. <laughs> and I still have a lot Legit. of things that I wanna try and learn. Um, That's great. So thank you very, very much for sharing your time with us and your expertise. And um, I truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you, Becca. Thank and you, thank you, thank you, Ryan and David too. and Christy. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, that thank you great. so much. And thank you to everyone who is watching. And um, we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Becca.